do you know who invented the television? Uh, when I was in the fourth grade, this is the television we had. It was a black and white, uh, 14 inch Philips television. And in school, we had a uh, school geometry, part one to four. And I think it was written by someone called something Hall. And then in the fifth grade, I think we had a newer television. It was a Panavision, a color television, 14 inch. But the book, the geometry book is still the same. It was uh, school geometry, part one to part four by Hall. Later on, uh, I think in the seventh or eighth grade, we had a newer television. Television was changing at that time. I think it was a Singer 20 inch television this time. And school, the geometry book was still the same. Other books were changing, but the geometry book was the same. Then, uh, much later, when I was in the uh, university, the television changed again. This time, it became the new flat screen television. It's completely different from what we used to have. But the geometry book done in school, it's, it's really more or less the same. Now that is very strange. Now I, I really don't know who invented the television. Is it John Logie Bear? Some, sometimes I hear his name, sometimes I hear some other name because the invention has been gone through so much changes. It's really difficult to say what's, what's going on. Well you see the inventor or shall I, if I use the term, got it right for geometry. Geometry is trying to understand what's happening around around us, what we see. The moon has a shape, looks like a circle. The sun also looks like a circle. And uh, we want to understand what's going on. And the literal translation is geo means earth, metro means measurement, earth measurement. But it's much more than them. that. It's, it's something to do with understanding, structure, logic, and also shapes. The person who's most responsible for writing the greatest textbook of all time, it's Euclid. And Euclid got it right. He wrote the elements. No wonder we use the book over and over again every year. Because Euclid, in that element, put everything down that needs to be done for geometry. Because geometry is not... Uh, just another part of math, it is math. The first university uh, was founded by Plato and that university said if you don't know geometry, get lost, you don't have to be here. So geometry was very very important then and also now, especially now when we have uh, modern math where, which is pure math which combines geometry with algebra and redefines it using coordinate geometry and then we have calculus. The geometry is also important for engineering, so it is very important. Now, does that mean that Euclid uh, started everything else? Before that, there was no one else and no one knew what, what was going on? That's not true. Before Euclid, we have two people. Pythagoras, uh, he, he, he has probably the most famous theorem in the world, Pythagorean theorem. His idea was, if it's a right angle triangle, and uh, then you can say that, uh, square of the largest side equal to sum of the square of the other two sides and they they thought of it literally square it was a square so this side and a square each side equal to this this side the area of this square is equal to the area of this square and this is that's how they thought about it and then we have Thales Thales uh, came up with the theorem of the triangles that if it's an isosceles triangle the base angles are equal uh, some of the angles of a uh, triangle, any triangle is 180 degree or two right triangles or if you have a semicircle inside this the triangle that you draw it's going to be 90 degree so they, these were around but what Euclid did was he put everything and explained everything very sophisticatedly nothing, nothing was left aside now a little background first of all what is a theorem. A theorem is a statement that has been proved. A statement that has been proved. What is a proof? Proof is 
logical reasoning so it is logical reasoning to arrive at a conclusion so that's a proof for example if you want to prove something how do you how do you start where do you start well there are two ways to prove something one thing is direct proof so Euclid knew this this one we have to prove it directly uh, for example if uh, we have uh, Lachu is a man so Lachu loves to eat so you, you prove it directly so you you just step by step you go you prove it directly so Lachu is a man Lachu loves to eat indirect proof is the other way indirect proof is proof by contradiction you you try to say it's wrong what Lachu is a man that doesn't mean that Lachu loves to eat because this no this no oh no no, no I'm sorry I, I'm wrong uh, Lachu loves to eat it's like proof by contradiction and, and failing to do that and finally you agree no this is right that's proof by contradiction and there's one more uh, proof that we can do if something happens the converse might be true so converse of something might be true not necessarily for example if you say uh, Lachu is a man that is Lachu loves to eat but if you say uh, Lachu loves to eat that means Lachu is a man not necessarily Lachu can be the name of a, of a horse or a, or a donkey uh, uh, in numbers we can say 3 to the 6 that means 2 3 to the 6 fine but you cannot do the same with subtraction 3 minus 2 is 1 2 minus 3 is minus 1 so so this is this is pretty difficult so where do you start now before talking about how did uh, Euclid thought about this let's think of a timeline now think of a timeline like some sort of a thermometer suppose we we are, we are doing this crazy thing of measuring time with thermometer so then we would be around uh, okay around here so this is 2000 degrees Celsius we are around here uh, 2000 degrees Celsius so um, if this is around 0 degrees Celsius so around minus 300 degrees Celsius that's very cold by the way minus 300 degrees Celsius is not possible way so minus 300 degrees Celsius also known as 300 BCE so that that at that time Euclid wrote the elements so this was the time Euclid wrote the elements and it was much before that so around here so it was around minus 500 degrees Celsius 500 BCE so we have Pythagoras and Thales at that time so what Euclid did he had to come up with something where do you start well you start with definition so how do you define it so in order to define it you have to start with the most simple thing to define and what is the simple thing to define okay this is this is the structure this is how he started so he started by defining a point so this is a point a point is that which has no part it doesn't really mean anything but hey he he has to start somewhere it doesn't have to mean anything a line is a breathless length so that means just length it's not it has, it's not no thickness it's just breadth so the ends of a line are points so that means you have this you have this so these are two points the ends are points okay and we have surface we have uh, solids we have 2d 3d everything it's defined so let me let me show you what the basic definition looks like so that means this is so this is the point and then we have this this is the line so a line has two points so this is one point this is one point so this is the surface or the shape two dimensional it has lines around it so it has lines around it it has points around it 
so we are going step by step and this is a solid it has surfaces or as we, we can also call it plane so it has planes around it plane so from here we can make this from here we can make this from here we can make this so let me show this so if you take a look here it's like this thing this has no dimension this has one dimension this has two dimension this has three dimensions so if you take a look here this is how the whole thing works so that means uh, the space that this will provide we call this space area the place that we have we call this volume because it's occupying three dimension but at the same time remember it is made up of surfaces like these so it can have surface area so he had to define uh, obtuse angle obtuse angle is angle that is larger than 90 degrees so if the angle is this so this is obtuse angle then you have acute angle which is less than 90 degrees so that's that's acute angle but wait a minute they didn't have 90 degree at that time there was no degree there was no, actually no algebra there is no even Pythagorean theorem they didn't have this algebra that c square equals a square equals b square they just wrote it in words so how does Euclid define it because Euclid is not like Thales or Pythagoras he, he wanted to define everything he wanted to be a good teacher he wanted to explain everything so this is his definition his definition is when you have a straight line so this, this, is, this is how he defines what is right angle or 90 degree so when you have a straight line and when you have another straight line that breaks that straight line into two equal angles each of the angle is 90 degrees it's, it is like this if you have this line and this line and they break equally then each of them are 90 degree now that's a pretty interesting definition and then the question comes okay how about we have this we have a cake like this and we have a line and the cake is different so this is 90 degree this is 90 degree now we have another cake we have we cut this this is 90 degree this is 90 degree does that necessarily mean that these two are equal well he talks about this later on so that right triangle is always equal so that there is no confusion that this is fixed and then he defines circles he defines uh, what is a circle what is a uh, equilateral triangle he defines all these things he defines parallel lines parallel lines are lines that do not meet so interesting so parallel lines are lines that do not meet okay after his work is done with the definition now we have to accept some basic assumption about geometry called postulate that means you don't have to I don't have to prove this you just have to accept it so what are the things that you need to accept postulate one to draw a straight line you can you, if you need this point you can just join two points have a straight line this is very important postulate so for this what do you need you need a straight edge or a scale and that's it and a pencil to produce a finite straight line continuously in a straight line okay if you have a scale if there is already a straight line you can just extend it if you want to no problem that's postulate 2 so that's a basic assumption about geometry postulate 3 to describe a circle with any center and radius okay if you know a center and if you know a distance means the radius you can draw a circle so that's how you draw a circle and for that you need a compass so the scale and compass no protractor he had no protractor so scale and compass that's why it's called the Euclidean tools okay then that all right angles are equal to one another remember previously his definition was when we talk about right angles it's a line that is equally dividing this line so if this angle is equal to any other right angle so then we can have a fixed value so that was important so otherwise people might think what is this why do we have this now number postulate number five is very famous because People think, couldn't this be a theory and theorem by itself? Why did he put it in a postulate? It's about how how do you assume about parallel lines? And he would use postulate 5 only once. He would use it only once in his uh, theorems, propositions. Uh, this, is, this is something that people still talk about. Why did he do it? Why did he not make it a theorem by itself? So this is very interesting and it says, if you have line and another line and the third line joins them if the angle here together is less than 180 degree they are going to meet 
that's that's interesting now comes the common idea that is general so postulate means common idea accepted idea about geometry specifically axioms means common idea or common notions about generally so things which are equal to the same thing are equal to one another pretty straightforward if if you have x equals to y and z equals to y they're equal to the same thing so x and z must be equal to each other if equals are added to equals then the wholes are equal so if you have x equals to y so they're equals if you added x plus a and y plus a you added two equal things then this must be equal to this again pretty obvious then the subtracted they should also be equal to x minus a should be equal to y minus a things which coincide with one another are equal to one another we use the word congruent now that means if you have a circle here and a circle here and if you can take this circle and place it over here and they exactly coincide well that's a that means they're equal the whole is greater than the part obviously if you if you add 1 plus 2 equals to 3 the so 3 is has to be greater than either 1 or 2 that's pretty obvious now the first proposition in the book that he solved let me show you how he did it 